button. How about now? Thank you. Brilliant. So it's working. Okay. Um, right. So in other words, lots of shar is simply below the cutoff, right? So its prominence is, is something like 86 meters, and so it's below the 500 meter cutoff, and so it didn't make this list, right? But and and once you have this this sort of persistence diagram, this idea, and this this way of representing the data, then you can slice and dice it in different ways. For example, you can ask what are the most prominent peaks um, on Earth. Yeah, there you go. And you start getting what should be usual suspects, right? Namely, the highest points in different continents, right? Because if you're at the at the highest point in the continent, you have to descend all the way down to the ocean before you can climb up or something higher on a different continent. So you got Mount Everest, you got Aconcagua, the highest point in the, in the Americas, Mount Denali in the Alaska, Kilimanjaro in Africa, and so forth. Okay. So um, this is your you know, three slide introduction to persistence. And um, if, if you look over how persistence has been used over the past, whatever it is, 20 years since it's been introduced, it's been very kind of descriptive. So sort of, it's, it's roughly this idea, but applied to, to lots of different kinds of data. Um, um, you know, we, we compute, we take some, some data, we compute its persistence diagram, and then we look at it, right? We look what are the, the, the points, what are the, the sort of these prominent peaks that it finds, or maybe we, use some metrics to compare persistence diagrams and do some statistics, or maybe we sort of vectorize them and feed them into machine learning algorithms, but it's all, it's all kind of uh, descriptive. And in the last uh, five years or so, there's been, sorry, this line, how did it choose this? I don't like that these slides are kind of, but, um, they try, try, try to open the chat at all time. I may be the chat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, brilliant. Okay, Pavel is the, is the expert. Um, so, so over the last five years or so, the, there's been kind of a new application or type of application uh, introduced to TDA. Namely, it's um, doing optimization using persistence as a loss. So if you can express some kind of a task that, that you want to, to solve where that, that, that's formulated in terms of optimizing the moving points in the persistence diagram, um, you can modify your data to match whatever this task is prescribing. And I think this is a very exciting development because it opens up a whole bunch of possibilities, right? I mean, yesterday we saw Jan's talk and Lakshmi's talk, this desire to now go back from, from the logical descriptor back to the data and figure out where, where things are coming from. You can imagine that if you take a point and you start moving it around and see how the data changes, you can get the idea of what's, what's responsible for that point. It's a little bit um, tricky to trace where, where, who, who introduced this first. So as far as I can tell, these three papers introduced this, this idea um, independently. So the first one was from 2016 by Gamiero, Hiroka, and Obayashi. So they, they interpolate between point clouds by taking the persistence diagram of one point cloud or another moving the points in the diagram from one to the other, and then back propagating this to the data, sort of to, to, to interpolate in the point clouds. Um, another idea, uh, this approach came from Fulinar, Shkab, and Asanikov, uh, where they solve lots of uh, geometry processing tasks, so manipulating meshes by doing the same kind of back propagation. So you take two meshes, you take some function on them, you put one persistence diagram, another, now you can morph one mesh into the other, so these sort of usual tasks that graphics people like of moving a person from one pose to another by, by moving points in the persistence diagram and, and back propagating. And um, yet another uh, approach or application came from Chao Chen and, uh, and co authors, this is Yusuf Wang, uh, where they use uh, persistence as a regularizer. So the idea is that if you have some machine learning classifier and you want to prevent overfitting, you, you want a topologically simple boundary. And, and so you can, you can describe the topology of the boundary with the, with the persistence diagram, and then you can um, sort of simplify this boundary as part of the, of the, of the training. So let me, let me explain, and then there is a persistence application which I'll come back to. Let me explain maybe just, just so that there are some more concrete um, examples, um, this sort of idea in some detail. So the, the kinds of examples of the losses that one could do, uh, for example, if you have a persistence diagram, you can say that I want to get rid of all the points that are closer than epsilon to the diagonal. And I will just define a loss that, that penalizes. So, so for every point that is closer than epsilon, I will just add a term that is death, death minus birth squared. 
right? And, and this, this will sort of try to push the points towards um, towards the diagonal. Um, another loss that that, that uh, Chen and colleagues were using um, is the idea that you want to simplify, get rid of all the points in a certain quadrant, which corresponds to the homology of a level set or sublevel set, depending on how you phrase it. And so, if you push push points out of the quadrant, then you, you will ensure that, that this sublevel set, level set, has a has a simple topology. And so, if your f, if your function f from which these persistence diagrams are coming, is not the elevation on the Earth, but for example, the response of some neural network, then getting rid of this uh, of these wrinkles, right? It, it's, it's a way to, to to regularize training. So, just just as a to make it even more concrete, if you have some you know a red point set and a blue point set, and you have some Classifier that's trained on them that tells you that you know here you have red and here you have blue, so it really has some some function that it outputs. So imagine this is the output of neural network. Now, if you have some outliers, your your function will your, your network can easily overfit by introducing these wrinkles, right? That, that try to go around the, the outliers. And so if you if you if you get rid of these wrinkles, right, you will you will avoid uh, overfitting. So if you do this for real data, well. Not Real data, but rather you can actually do this with a, with a, with a real neural, neural network. So here's an example um, that, that we tried. You take uh, three um, Gaussian, you have three clusters sampled from, from, from Gaussians, then you shuffle some labels. If you just train a vanilla kind of neural network on this, uh, it will learn the outliers and it will overfit. So these, these, these are the points that are highlighted that are overfitted in bold. On the other hand, if you track during training when the overfitting started, so people do this with by, by tracking validation loss in, in machine learning. And then you hit it with this optimization. So you say, let's get rid of all the wrinkles in, in our uh, in our response. Then you get uh, the, this sort of picture on the right, which is, um, well, there are fewer outliers and I guess they make more sense, right? The green points are next to the, um, next to the green cluster. So that's, that's sort of the idea of, of how people have used or you can use topological optimization for machine learning. The other place that um, I think I think uh, this this is useful, or, or sort of how this connects to past work, um, sort of shortly after persistence was introduced, uh, we posed this this idea of, of persistence sensitive simplification. So the idea is you have function f, uh, you're given some threshold epsilon, and you want to get rid of all the noisy features, so, so everything that, that has persistence less than epsilon. So, so similar to the loss that I showed, so all these points need to be gone. Um, and so can you find a function G that is close to F that, that doesn't have these points? So in other words, a function that kind of flattens these spots out. Um, and and uh, when, when this question was posed, uh, we sort of answered it for extrema. So for, for dimension zero um, uh, features. Uh, and in fact, you can do this in, in linear time. But if you are interested in higher dimensional features and particularly middle dimensional features, then this is actually a very difficult problem to solve. And an easy way to see that this is a difficult problem to solve is that imagine that I, in sometimes impossible problem to solve, but imagine that I give you a homology sphere, I give you some function of it. This function will look like this, right? It will have one uh, point of infinity in the zero dimensional diagram, one point of infinity in the three dimensional diagram, and then lots of finite points. Now, if I ask you to simplify all the finite points, right? Well, this would mean finding a function with just two critical points, which is of course, Impossible because this would mean that the domain is a sphere. So, in other words, no epsilon simplification can exist for a sufficiently high epsilon naught. But in practice, I mean, this question is very interesting for the three spheres. So if I give you a function on a three dimensional domain and now I ask you to simplify one dimensional homology, this, this comes up in applications a lot. I mean, we give this sort of technology in, in visualization. This is, this is a, an important question, but we actually don't know how, how, how to solve this and it would be useful to, to have a solution. And you can imagine, I mean, again, if you think about this for a second, there are lots of obstructions, different kinds of obstructions that, that you can encounter, right? So if you have a, a, a circle, you know, attach a, a disk as a dance cap, right? Then suddenly you, you, you cannot, I mean, it's not collapsible, so you cannot define a um, discrete Morse function that, is, um, that, 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 that kills it. So you have to go somewhere higher. But you can approach this question, of course, kind of do your best, best effort uh, approach by, by using ideas from, from optimization. And so let me pause because I, I cannot quite tell if, if everything is okay. Yes, okay, I see one thumbs up, I see two thumbs up. Okay, I will interpret this as everything's okay. Okay, so, so the, way, the way that people approach uh, optimization, well, you know, I, I said that you can do this. Uh, the way that this actually works is 
uh, sort of the standard approach to optimization is that if you're given um, some simplicial complex K and you're given a function F on it, then every point in the persistence diagram just from how the, the algorithms are defined uh, is really comes from two pairs of simplicities, right? Persistence really tells you that a class created by simplex sigma is killed by simplex tau. And so in the persistence diagram, if you have a point, it really means that it's F of sigma comma F of tau. And so if you want to move, if, if somehow your loss tells you that this point needs to move by some, some gradient GP, well, then this really just means that the values of F sigma and F tau need to be modified by the, by the coordinates of this, um, of this vector. And then you can, however, whatever it generates your F, I mean, this could be some, you know, one of these standard Vitori strips constructions or star filtrations, anything, you can back propagate through that. And this gives you information about how to change your actual input data that, that's responsible for this filtration. Right, so it, it's, it's kind of as simple as, as it gets. So this, this is why it keeps getting rediscovered by, by different people. Um, but this, this has sort of a, a problem, a limitation. It's, um, it's very kind of inefficient. It requires taking lots of steps. And it's, it's a very kind of circuitous thing uh, to do. So if you think about it, right? So suppose that here's my function. I have, I have two points. I have this point, which corresponds to, to, this, to the pair of these two points. And now I want to push it to the diagonal. Right, so the gradient tells me that you need to go this way. This translates into lifting this point a little bit and pushing this point a little bit down. If I take a single step, well, suddenly my function changed. You know, some new points popped up. Now the gradient tells me that this point suddenly starts has to go down rather than up. Right, so something strange starts happening. I take another step. Things fix themselves, but I take another step, and now it's it's sort of it's very chaotic. It's very non-monotone, and sort of strange things are happening just by the virtue of that we're getting so little information back, right? You take a step and um, things keep flip-flopping. Now, momentum helps a lot, as it always does with the position here, because it's sort of, if a point is moving in one direction, it will keep moving in one direction. Uh, but, but still, you, it, it requires, requires doing a lot of work. And there is a, sort of, I call this a standard approach, but this is almost the only approach, because there is a kind of a dearth of algorithms for, for solving this uh, problem. And the only um, sort of, non-trivial algorithm that, that, that exists that I know of um, was proposed just last year by Guigny, uh, Carrier, Lacan, and Nadeau. And um, the idea is roughly the following. So they observe that if you view your filtration as a function on Rn, where n is the number of synthesis, and you know, the, value, the, the point just represents the, the filtration, the, the value is assigned to the synthesis, then the space is stratified by the different orderings of the synthesis, right? So, on one side, you know, tau one is less than tau two, tau, tau one greater than tau two, and then there are these lower dimension strata where the simplicities become equal. Um, and if you just do naive gradient descent, sort of the reason that the things are slow is that you keep bouncing between strata, right? You, 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 start, you start in one place, you compute the gradient, you take a step, but suddenly the, the, the order of the simplices changed. So now a different simplex needs to move and needs to move down. And so you keep bouncing. And this also suggests why, the, why momentum helps, but yeah. Um, and so they suggested this idea that what you can do is when you start at a point, or when you're sitting at, at, at a point in the space, you can sample the gradients on the nearby strata. This gives you a subgradient, sort of a degree of entire convex hull of, of, of gradients, and you can pick the direction of steepest descent among those. And then you follow that, and what this sort of translates into is that you, you, you get to, to, to the stratum where, where tau 1 equals tau 2, and you just, you just keep, keep going down. Um, now it's it's a little bit tricky to do because if you have k, so if, if your uh, co-dimension is not one but k, now you have you know, k plus one synthesis to worry about. You need to consider k plus one factorial orders in order to sample the strata. So you have to do something clever. They, they, and they do lots of clever things. So, so this is a great paper and you know, you should take a look at it. Um, but that's that's the only thing that exists out there. And all of, uh, both the, the standard approach and this approach, um, it sort of treats persistence as a black box. Right, it sort of I give you some some simplices, I give you a filtration. I have I get a pairing between these simplices, and that's all the information that I use. But of course, if you I mean, well, many of you work with persistence, and you, and you know that there's a lot more information under the hood. We're just not showing these persistence diagrams. So my goal in this talk is to open up this black box, but to do so, I need to restrict myself to a simpler case because in general, it's, it's just too complicated. Um, and so. I will restrict myself to, to what I would call singleton loss. And um, the idea is the following, right? That 
any of virtually any laws that has been uh, suggested in the literature, I can think of it as a matching. So I have my input diagram in blue, and I have some target diagram in red. That that really is just is, and, and the matching between the points, where, where it says that the blue point needs to move, move to the matched uh, red point. So when I when I was talking about simplification, right? If I want to get rid of all the points below the epsilon threshold, well, this really means that I take the blue points below the threshold and I match match them to the diagram. If I'm if I'm trying to simplify the uh, quadrants or sublevel set, then I match the point to the nearest point outside the point. Right. So so that's that's kind of how you go from from a loss to 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 the matching. And so what what I want to consider in this talk is the simplest possible such such situation. Namely, I have a matching, but it's a partial matching with just a, a single pair uh, matched. So I have a blue diagram. I have one red point. So I have one blue point that needs to move somewhere. And in particular, I don't care what happens to the rest of the point. So one, for one point, they prescribe a target. And the rest of the points, you know, if they move in the process, then so be. I have a place no concern. So I will call such a thing a single to block. Yeah? You don't keep the other points fixed. I, it's impossible to keep the other points fixed, right? So as I'm moving the blue point to the red point, other points will, will, will move in some way, but I place no, no concern. Okay, so let's open the, the persistence black box. Um, by this, I mean that uh, the, the persistence pairing, oh, I jumped too far. Uh, the persistence pairing, right, the way the, way the algorithms of the, 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 the standard VG reduction due to Edel Brun, Lecher, and Zamarodian, the way this works is that you take, you have some simplicial complex, you have your filtration, so you take the boundary matrix of the simplicial complex, uh, you order the, the the rows and columns with respect to the filtration, then you reduce it. And you reduce it, meaning that you compute the matrix R such that the lowest non zeros are in unique rows of the um, yeah, in unique rows. Um, and it's, it's exactly these, these non zeros that give you the persistence pair, right? So if I have uh, the sigma is the lowest non zero in the column of tau, then there's a pair of sigma tau. And moreover, if you keep track of the how you, do, you computed this reduction, so how you computed from how you went from D to R, and you record uh, can record this information. You can think of this as a matrix decomposition. So it's R equals D V, or if you use U to denote the inverse of V, then D equals R U. Um, did this thing just die? Yeah. <laughs> first, first microphone of the day is down, right? Okay. Yes, yes, brilliant. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so you can think you can think of a persistence computation as a site composition, and this is um, this is what's recorded in this R equals DD uh, picture. Um, and there is the kind of intuitive interpretation of all of this that it's useful to keep in mind. So if I have some function, so I think of this as a landscape, and I have my sigma is an edge that creates a, a, a one cycle, and tau is the triangle that kills this one cycle, right? Then the column R of, tau, R of tau really stores exactly this one cycle that's, that's being created by sigma. And sigma is the, the, the highest simplex in the cycle. But the column B also has an intuitive interpretation. It's simply the chain, right? It's, it's exactly the, the two chain whose boundary is this blue, blue cycle, right? Just, just, just from the decomposition, right? Because V of tau multiplied by the, by the boundary gives you the are, are of that. Um, and this picture is somehow suggested, right? So if, if I wanted to get rid of this uh, wrinkle, right, of this mountain, I wanted to push it all the way down, then, well, it's, it's not difficult to see that it's exactly this, this red cap that I have to push down. Right. Now, in general, you should be very suspicious of this kind of intuition because things that are true in, in co-dimension one or in dimension zero, they never, never generalize to anything. But in fact, if you remember, if there is only one thing you remember from this talk, it should be this. In fact, it does generalize. So it's, it's always the case that, that the things that you need to move is going to be exactly the column uh, V of tau or maybe U of tau, depending on the situation. In some sense, this, this picture does generalize down to arbitrary dimensions. So let, let, me, let me explain what, what I mean by this. And, and the, the very useful notion here is that of critical set. So, so suppose that I have the following situation. I start. I have three simplices, tau one, tau two, tau three. They have values zero, a quarter, and three quarters. And 
somehow my loss tells me that I want to set the value of tau one to be one, right? So that's the only goal, which, which really means on the previous uh, formulation that tau one is paired with some sigma that defines the point in the persistence diagram. And I want to move that point from whatever is the value of sigma comma zero to whatever is the value of sigma comma one. Right? Um, and so if you, if you just follow the gradient of this loss, right? Well, here it will tell you that, well, what do you have to do? You have to increase the value of tau one. So you can go, 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 increase the value of tau one until it becomes equal to the value of tau two. And then there are two possibilities, right? If you switch the order, tau two becomes paired with sigma, and then it's tau two that I have to move, or it doesn't become paired with sigma. So if it doesn't become paired with sigma, then, then the situation doesn't change. But my loss tells me that I have to push uh, tau one to the right. But now if it does switch the pairing with, the, with tau three in this case, then actually what happens is that now I have to push them together. Right, so I have to go in this direction because if I if, if tau one comes second, right, it will be paired with sigma. If tau three comes or rather first, if tau three comes first, then it's paired with sigma. And so the point is that it's it's exactly sort of I have to go along this lower dimensional stratum, and um, in other words, I have to my final destination if I just follow the gradient is going to be tau one equals one, tau three equals one, and tau two stays in the quarter. So this is under the assumption that tau one and tau two don't change pairing, but tau one and tau three do. And so in, in, in this situation, I call tau one and tau three the, the critical set. And these are the simplices that have to move, that have to move together. Um, and of course, if you know, a critical set is kind of a, an important uh, you know, set, because if you know what it is, well, one, it tells you what is this final stratum that you have to move along. But two, it also tells you what your final destination is, right? If you can somehow from the beginning figure out what the critical set is, then you can take what I call the big step, right? From, from the beginning all the way to the end. So that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out what this critical set is and we're going to do it efficiently. Okay, now let me pause because I see some confused faces. Please ask questions because it's going to get worse from this point. <laughs> Jeremy. Oh, you just, I, I decided that in this particular situation, it's not going to switch. So you can imagine, right? I mean, if tau two is a different connected component, just because their values are the same, the pairing is not going to change. So it's, it's, only, it's only the simplest, right, where the pairing can switch like this that, that, that matter. Now, in order to make a big step you know, this critical step will change. How do you know this by what, what, what a great question, Pavel. Yes, I, I, that's. That's what we're going to figure out. Yes. Okay. If it is like a transportation between these two methods, shouldn't like something distant between these two things come here because it is like you have a distribution on the first row and then you just want to move everything on tau one. Oh, so, sorry. This the, the fact the fact that these values sum up to one is a pure pure coincidence. Okay. Yes, I. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, add, add 100 to everything, right? So, sorry, that's, I mean, that's good catch, but, but my mistake. Um, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So let, let's do critical set again, but now in terms of location, because, because it's, uh, you know, second time is a charm or something, right? So, so the idea is that if we, so I have, I have sigma paired with tau, and now let's say I'm decreasing the value of tau. And now, the, the, if, if the simplex that immediately precedes tau is tau one, right? I need to figure out what happens after I, I transpose them. If after, then there are two things that can happen, right? So either if I transpose them, tau remains paired with sigma, or if I transpose them, tau one becomes paired. With sigma. In the first case, the critical set doesn't change. In the second case, I have to add tau one to the critical set. And now I have to ask this question about the entire critical set, right? So I have some critical set x k minus one. There is some tau k. And the question is, what happens if I move tau k to the right? right? Either it switches or it doesn't switch. Um, yeah, okay. So, so the definition is, is just recapitulated. Um, and, and the definition is the same. So if it's, I, I gave it for, for the death, but it's the same for the birth, death, if the value is increasing or decreasing, it's always a, a contiguous set of simplices such that if you take the first or the last, it's going to be paired with whatever is your target. Sigma in this case. Um, so critical set has a couple of properties that are important uh, to verify. Um, then 
I mean, they, to me, they were counterintuitive, which is why maybe to, to others they're not. Uh, but uh, the, the first property is that if, that if we add the simplex to the critical set, other simplices don't fall out of it. So this, this follows simply from the fact that uh, the, whether sigma is paired with tau depends only on what simplices come up before sigma and between sigma and tau. And so if, if I add a simplex to the critical set from, from K2 to the critical set, this, the pair of sigma and tau is not going to be affected. And the opposite statement is also true that if I move a simplex past the critical set, right? So if I have some tau k, now I move it to the right and the pairing doesn't change, so it doesn't belong to the critical set, none of the simplices already in the critical set are going to fall out. Because you can imagine, right, that I removed something, suddenly something stopped being, stopped being critical in the sense, but it's, it's not difficult to verify that, that this is, um, yeah, that this, 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 this cannot happen. In other words, critical set can only grow. As I'm moving my simplex, some simplices will be added, 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 which is in, in the previous slide was the fact that we went from the lower and lower and lower um, dimensional strata. So because of this, you can imagine a very simple and very naive algorithm, which says that let's just simulate what we've been doing, right? Let's take our simplex tau k, let's just keep dragging it through the filtration from, from whatever it started d to the target d prime. And every time I, I encounter a new simplex tau k, I will just transpose it with, this, with, with everything in the critical set, and I will check what the pairing is. And I can perform these transpositions efficiently in, in linear time, and that's that sort of value. It's, it's not a good algorithm, it's, it's, it's slow, right? It's something like m squared n, where m is the number of simplices between where you start and where you want to end, and n is the size of k, but, but it's, it's an algorithm that's sort of easy to understand. Okay, so, so the main result that, that, that I want to sort of, um, uh, I wanted to, to get across today is that you can identify what the critical set is in linear time. And in fact, it's an incredibly simple algorithm. It's one that you can implement in you know, less time than it's taken me to talk so far. Uh, namely, the statement is the following, that if you're trying to increase the value of the, of the depth, so if you're trying to move tau to the right, you have to look at all the simplices between the D and D prime, so where you started and where you want to end, um, that have in the matrix U, remember there was V and there was U was V inverse, that lie in the row of tau and have an, have a non-zero in the row of tau. And if you're decreasing that, you have to do the same thing, but now you have to look at the column of D. So the picture that I was showing before where the column of D was, was playing the important role, this is true always, right, for, for any dimension. The only catch is that, so I mentioned that this, this R equals DV decomposition is not unique. Maybe I didn't mention, I should have mentioned. It's not unique, now you know. Um, but um, so, so for, for this to, to, to work, you have to compute the matrices B and U that you get from the original this 3D reduction from so, um, I was doing the Lecher's and Merodian algorithm. And if you do this, then you will get matrices that tell you exactly. So if you look at the rows and, and columns, they tell you exactly what are the simplices in the critical set. So in other words, what are the simplices that when the pairing, when, when you transpose them with your tau with your critical set, uh, the pairing will switch. And of course, this is great because you can do this in your time, right? You just during it. Go back to that picture where you have the blue side over here, and then you have the red simplex closing, right? Yep. So what you're doing is you're computing the red cap, and you're computing it either starting from the top going down, or you're computing it from the bottom going up, and the simplices that are included in the cap are your critical set. That's right. So if 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 I want to move <laughs> tau down to sigma, right. then the the red simplices are exactly the critical set. Right. So, okay. Great. If I wanted to do something else, if I wanted to move it up, I would have to look at the inverse of D, and it's it's a little bit harder to visualize, which is why I'm checking out. But yes, that's exactly it, right? So so the, so in this picture, the critical side is exactly in the right cap. And maybe another statement is also that if I didn't want to move tau all the way down to sigma, but only some part way down, then it's the red simplices up to that point so at that color. So your big step just corresponds to flattening just because it cut them out in all colors. That's right. Great. Great. Well, in this case, it is exactly the, the descending magnitude. But, but, but in, in more general situation, so, so the pro problem is that here you don't have to so, so the row, the, the reason I'm only, I was only showing V is that U is a very counterintuitive kind of matrix. 
it's it's sort of it's the synthesis whose reduction have touched how and they can be all over the place. So it's not it's not and you can imagine right that if I was trying to raise this mountain up, what I have to worry about are the other mountains that will or the pairing will switch. Yeah. So it's it's not yeah. Um okay, so I I, I promised the proof, but I think I'm going to skip it because it's not a hard proof, but it's, it's yeah. Um yeah, so I've been talking about only about death so far. Now it's not sort of a fondness for morbidity or anything, right? But it's, although in persistence, this is kind of a constant problem, right? You have to think about these things. Um, but it's just that that with homology, what you do when you do this with homology, you get get that. But we also want to do birth, right? We also want to move the point uh, to change the birth value. And there's a very simple trick which makes life very easy. And the trick is the following, right? That if we if we if we switch from homology to cohomology, persistence pairing doesn't change, right? Just just by duality, except the role of birth and death changes, right? So if I have a, a homology, a, a cycle that's created at ki that becomes zero at, at kj, then there's going to be a co-cycle in kj that, by restriction, will disappear past ki. Right? So you get you get the same the same pairing but slightly different interpretation, and um, some years back, in fact, with Mikhail and, and with Ben De Silva, we showed that if you want to compute cohomology, there is a very, you can use the same exact algorithms, but you have to replace the boundary matrix D that's ordered by, um, by the filtration with a boundary matrix D bot, which is a sort of a transpose, but where the rows and columns are reordered by, by filtration. So instead of going from 1 to n, they go from n down to 1. And um, the statement that the pairing is the same really translates into the fact that if you have sigma paired with tau, in other words, there's a column of r tau whose lowest and zero is, is sigma, then in matrix r bot, you're going to have a column r sigma whose lowest non zero is going to be in the row of tau. Right? So that's it, if and only. But now let's think of what it is that I showed in the previous sort of slide, except I skipped the proof. I said that if you want to move tau um, down, you have to look at the column of v tau. It was purely a matrix kind of operation, right? But if I want to decrease the value of tau, in other words, move the column to the left, I have to look at the, at the, uh, the column v tau. Well, if I want to move sigma to the left, which in this case means moving its value up, right? Because the progression is, is, is in opposite direction, then by the same, literally by the same argument, I have to look at this v bot uh, sigma. In other words, there's there's nothing else. It's it's exactly we, we already know everything. Duality buys us a great deal for free. So just to summarize this, right? Uh, if you're increasing death, you would be looking at u tau, so the row of tau in u increasing. If you're decreasing death, you would be looking at the column of v of tau. Now, if you want to decrease birth, you're looking at u bot of sigma. If you want to this will decrease birth, and if you wanted to increase birth, you look at v bot of, of sigma. In other words, these matrices. V U and V bot U bot tell you everything you need to know to compute the critical sets. So there is there is kind of nothing else to worry about. Um, except there is one more thing to worry about, namely these faces of cofaces, which I haven't said anything about, right? Because if you're moving simplex tau or the critical set, then if you're moving it to the left, then in order to maintain the filtration, you have to take into account all of the faces, right? If you're moving it down, the faces have to come before the cofaces. And so you cannot transpose, right? You cannot move a simplex before its face. So you you, ha you have to identify all the faces or cofaces. You could do this in um, this time um, O of dm, where m is the number of simplices um, in, in your critical set. But in fact, this is not even necessary. Uh, in practice, you can ignore this because what you're actually doing, right? You, you, you're, you're saying that the critical set will have to move, the values will have to move from D to D prime, but then you're going to back propagate this through your, whatever is your function back to your data, then you will update your data, and then you will reconstruct the function, you will do, create a new filtration, and that will enforce for you that actually the faces come before the cofaces and you have, you have everything nice and, nice and clean. So this, it's not, the, the, the savings are not so much computational, it's, it's much easier to implement, you don't have to worry about it. So that's a that's a useful thing. Okay, so to summarize, the algorithm is, is, is very simple. Um, if you have some matching, you know, if you have your loss expressed as a matching, 
uh, called M, then, uh, and, and you're trying, yeah, you're trying to move points from, from P, uh, PI to QI, then for each PI and QI, you identify the critical set for, for, uh, for the birth, for the sigma, uh, you identify the critical set for the death, so depending on, on which way you're moving, you're looking at one of the other matrix. And now um, you record the values for the synthesis in, in, this, in this array target, because now you have a problem, right? So if, you, if you're no longer working with a singleton loss, so where you're just moving one point, if you're moving a bunch of points, you have conflict, right? Because one point wants to move a simplex to one place, another point wants to move a simplex to another place. You have to keep track of this. And then the, the heuristic that we, we use is uh, just take Whoever wants to move it the furthest win, wins. So you take the maximum displacement. But actually, if you if you also do um, this is motivated if you if you're doing zero dimensional simplification, it's, it's exactly the right thing to do. Uh, but we also tried the averaging, and nothing nothing really changed um, in any kind of meaningful way. And then this gives you the loss, and this is what so for every simplex you now suddenly get a bunch of information of where where it needs to go. Okay, so um, we implemented this. We did some um, experiments. So the first is um, this uh, quadrant loss, right? Where you, you have a bunch of points and you're trying to move them out of the quadrant. And the data comes from, um, you know, from some simulation of magnetic reconnection. Um, so let me, let me explain what these plots are. So this is, this is a vineyard plot, right? So we have, um, we keep track of how the points are moving and we project it onto two, onto two views. The first one is the, birth plus death persistence plane. So in other words, we have a view from the top down. And the other one is, here's the step number. So how many steps we took, and this is persistence, right? So, so it's a two, two views on the same thing. And this is the, the, the usual, the standard algorithm we call diagram method. And uh, maybe the point, right, and the color is simply the step number. So, so it always goes from, from purple to yellow. And in this view, it's helpful because you can see that you know, where the point started, versus where they end up. Maybe the point of this, of this plot is that um, not all of them, so in 50 steps, not all of them reach the quadrant, right? So they, they, you don't completely simplify this. On the other hand, if you use what I described, the critical set method, then in fact, it takes much less than 50 steps. Everything <laughs> shoots down, shoots outside of the quadrant. Although what you see also, right, is that not all the points are following the kind of straight lines to the post point. They had other points are pushing them in different directions. And another way to, to look at this is uh, to look at the loss, right? So in other words, just to visualize what this loss is using two different methods, um, the diagram method and the, and the critical set method, and just to keep, keep track of it over the steps. And uh, so this plot, I guess, shows you immediately that if you use the diagram method, right, it's, it, it sort of the loss decays very slowly. If you use momentum, you get better performance, but still comparatively slow, whereas the critical set method, the thread curve, I mean, it just shoots down, right? Because it takes a whole bunch of synthesis at once and it just pushes them all, all down. And um, maybe another thing that's, that's kind of interesting here is that although for the diagram method, the momentum helps a great deal, right? The difference between blue and purple is, is quite large. Uh, for the critical set method, it's, it's much less, less significant, right? So going from red to green is, is not quite, quite as dramatic. So another example is, is simplification, right? So where we're just trying to get rid of all the points now in the one dimensional persistence diagram. So this is the case that we don't know how to treat theoretically. Um, and so this is the diagram method. So I guess here the idea is that all these guys should go to zero, but the fact that you see yellow in this slice means that not all of them reach the diagonal. But on the other hand, if you follow the critical set method, then everything just shoots down to the diagonal, right? So everything immediately, it's, it's a much, much steeper decline. You, you, you simplify virtually everything. And it's completely obvious from the, from the loss plots. Because, so this is a logarithmic scale. The, uh, the diagram loss, uh, the diagram method keeps the loss, you know, it, it gets to, I don't know, 10 to negative two or something. Whereas the critical, critical set method is much better. And with momentum, it really shoots down. You can drive it as far down as as you can in very few steps. Uh, what's also interesting is, I mean, if you, if you do these kinds of optimization algorithms, the, the usual pain is to play with the learning rate because it's somehow everything is very dependent on the learning rate. Okay. So uh, I'm going to do this diagram here. Uh, the yellow line uh, is the high yeah. of the crystal set. Right. So, so I, 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 right. So good, good eye. 
Um, I don't have much to say, but other than the fact that the critical, so if momentum is crucially useful, crucially important for the diagram loss, but for the critical set method, if you crank it up, it somehow starts overshooting, right? Because it's it, the critical set already tells you where to go. And if you maintain too much of the momentum from the previous step, it, it somehow just hurts you. Unlike with the with the diagram losses, as much you can crank, the more you crank it up, the better off, off you are. Yeah. And um right. So so the uh, picture here is that on the let's see, so the task is we, we want to simplify the function to some prescribed value. We want to bring loss down to some prescribed value. We vary the learning rate, which is what's on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we track how many steps we have to take. Um, and sort of you see that the 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 sort of the, the diagram the diagram um, method uh, does okay, but for high learning rate, actually momentum hurts it as well. So this is this was your question, I guess, Miguel, right? Oh, your, your question was about the critical set, right? Uh, and the critical set performs much much better. And in fact, sort of you get roughly ten x fewer steps required for the for, for this compared to the diagram. So if you want to do this in, in practice, right, this this, this buys you buys you quite a bit. Um, Okay, so so some final final thoughts that um, I guess um, need to be said. Uh, the biggest shortcoming of this method, right? So in, in the previous slides, I showed everything in terms of number of steps, which should make you very suspicious, right? Because if I, if I wanted to be you know, for full disclosure, I would be showing you running times, but I'm showing you steps. And um, the reason is, that, of course, to, to compute the critical set, you have to compute these matrices B and B bot, which requires more time to compute than just the matrix R. Um, but it's not it's not that much. Well, matrix U is, is essentially free because you're just recording what, what operations you were doing in the, in the other matrices. Um, and so in the experiments that I was showing, the, the amount of time taken per step is about four times slower. So with 10 times fewer steps, you're still winning, but it's not it's not quite quite as, as impressive. Um, here there is some hope. Uh, there is a very recent work by um, Lou and Nelson on this idea of if you compute persistence and then you change the filtration a little bit and you want to recompute persistence, you want to update it, they give a very simple algorithm that, um, that updates persistence uh, from, from R equals DVD decomposition. So in other words, they do need the matrix V, but it's significantly faster. And so you get the matrix V for free. The only problem is that what you get from their method doesn't give you the greedy reduction. It's not the same decomposition as, as you get from the ELZ algorithm. And so there's an open question how to go, how to improve that so that you can get, you can get that. Um, the second observation I wanted to point out is that knowing about this V and, and V bot, uh, you have some flexibility in how you define your matching. So for example, if you wanted to push the point to the diagonal, I just showed this situation, right? Where you match point to the closest point on the diagonal. But of course, you could have pushed, instead of going to, to the average, you could have gone to birth comma birth. Or you could have gone to death, comma death. And then in this situation, right, if you go to birth, birth, you only need matrix V because you're only decreasing the, the death value. In this situation, you only need matrix V bot, so you get a lot of get a lot of room to play with these kinds of things, which is which is also something that you can you can take into account when, when designing what you're doing. Um, and the final remark, and I think, I think the most interesting open question is how to couple this tighter with the optimizers, because when you when you do optimization, right, there are all these things that you have to worry about and play with, like figuring out the learning rates, figuring out you know, how, how to take the step size, the right step sizes. Um, but here, from from the critical set, you get a lot of information. You know how far you can go for any given loss, how, how far you can take a step where where it's sort of safe, where, where you know that, that that things will behave the way you expect them. And so and so figuring that out is is maybe an important open question. And well, what Mikhail asked sort of how does this all relate to momentum? Why does it behave one way in the diagram method, another way in the critical set method? I think is, is also a major open question, but unfortunately I have nothing to say on this. So on that note, I will stop and I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Mikhail. Explains more about why the matrix composition is not unique because that seems to give you a degree of flexibility that is unique in the implementation. But I, I guess I didn't, I didn't fully enter what was happening. So, so the, the reason the decomposition is not unique uh, is that you can.
imagine that I take this column, I add it to this column, my lowest non zeros haven't changed. And yet I got something else. So the statement is that the decomposition is not unique, but the lowest non zero will always be the same as long as the matrix R is reduced. Yeah, and, and, and the problem is that it, it doesn't, and in fact, it constrains you. So, so you're right that, that the, the non uniqueness in every other situation buys you a lot of freedom. But in this situation, because we have to have these matrices that come from this beauty deduction, it constrains us because if we get the update from some other method, we can't use them. The, the, the columns will be different and therefore they won't tell us what the critical sets are. So, so what that would mean is it would take the the same algorithm using one of the matrices, you would be moving multiple disjoint sets at the same time. That's right. So you can imagine if I had some other wrinkle somewhere here, right? So I had some, some bump over here. I could add its column, you know, this cycle to this cycle. Nothing would change in terms of the pairing, in terms of the composition. But now my column of V would have this cap and another cap. So this has to do with trying to make the individual operation. You're, you're thinking about single awesome. That's right. Yes. Okay. Other question? Thank you, Dimitri. Thanks. We have five minutes, right? Yeah, five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Search for the table. It reminds me a lot of um, uh, since you, um, you know, the difference between the interior optimization methods and the simple calculus. How will, oh, oh, so yeah, do you know how to connect to my English? Uh, is that's it right, possible? yeah, to the interior. No, this is a full one. Yeah. No, I want to, I have cable also. I want to connect, I have the, 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 the so how I put my slide here. Oh, because he connects his computer. But where? Uh, Dimitri, I, I have cable. Okay, let's see. Dimitri, where did you hook up your computer? Where do you connect? Very, 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 very strange. You open this. <laughs> and there should, there should be. Yes, if you find out what is this. Yeah. There's a power cell. Oh, ah, yeah, but oh it's the point. I want to connect the, the, the tablet to. Um, does it have Wi Fi? Yes, I can use it. Uh, I can yeah. connect through Wi Fi. Yeah, so I send you the, the link to the room. You can also send it to the But you send us yeah. by, via email. Is yeah, but I, but, but I send you. Yeah, that's the same one. From me. Uh, look, yeah. yeah, so I connect and then, and then you can just share. Ah, yeah. okay. uh, continue. So, so join the video. No, okay. got it. Got it. No, no, I have done something wrong. Okay. No, no, no. So, I joined the meeting. Yes. And okay, the universe is, yeah. not, is not one to one. Right? Can you bring your speakers um, down? And then yes. So I joined with video. 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 Without video. Okay. And? No, no. Audio. No audio because my voice is caught your by. Voice will be going the mic. Uh, okay, that's, that's all. Now I am. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, uh, I should have some. Okay, share content. Uh, screen. Yes, hello. Yeah. Well, so it's, it's, it's really to the out there Thank you. And, um, and, and it was okay. Two okay. Hours. Okay. Okay. I'm still <laughs> sharing, but I want to share these. Well, yeah, so, I mean, it should pop up this. Yeah, okay. Um,
Okay. So I, uh, I want to close this. No. Fuck. Um, okay. Okay. Understood. Yeah. I want to take it away because. Uh, Okay. We still have three minutes, right? Yeah. So it's working. Oh, yes, we need to stop and start recording just to have a heavy delivery. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's working. Fine. Okay, so it's working fine. And just get it. Thank you. 